Well, welcome back. This is part two of the Master Naturalist Intern Training. Part one, hopefully you got an appreciation and an idea of why entomology is so interesting and why insects are important to be studied. And in this section, we're gonna be covering how to classify insects. So you can identify an insect versus another animal. So you can identify insects hopefully down to order or at least the most common types of order and just kind of get an idea of where insects fall in the grand scheme of all living things. So when we look at how animals are classified, if you remember from school, animals are classified into domains, which are big giant groups that are considered basically eukaryotic or prokaryotic organisms. Domains contain all eukaryotes. So there's domain, domain eukarya and it's every single an animal that has a eukaryotic cell in its body or is made up of eukaryotic cells. Kingdom animalia, is also a very broad, overarching, giant group. So these are all the animals in Kingdom Animalia, very diverse group because you know that um, eels are very different than lizards, are very different than tigers, very different than humans. Phylum now starts to narrow down a tad bit more and insects are in the phylum arthropoda. So now they have branched off separate from humans and other mammals, we're uh, chordates, we're in the phylum chordata. But, but insects are in the phylum arthropoda. And you can see also from this image, there are lots of other types of, of arthropods, not just necessarily insects. What encompasses only insects is the class insecta. So class insecta is within phylum arthropoda, within the kingdom animalia, and within the domain eukarya. And then if we keep going down, there are orders of insects. And there are about 30 to 35 different orders of insects, depending on which taxonomist you like to follow. Um, and there are probably 10 of those or so that are really common um, to most of us as naturalists or as gardeners or as people that spend time outdoors. So the order Lepidoptera, and for example, encompasses all of the butterflies and moths and skippers. So again, pretty broad because you know that there's a lot of different species of these guys. Now let's break it down further and we'll look at maybe the specific type of insect, the monarch butterfly. Well, monarch butterflies are found within the family of the order Lepidoptera. They're in the family Nymphalidae. And these are all brush-footed butterflies. And you can see that there's a huge diversity even within just this family of butterflies. There are well over 300, 750, I'm sorry, different families of insects. So if you're sending an insect to an entomologist to be identified down to species, unless it is a field or a, a specific insect that they study, it's gonna be very difficult for us to get it down that far. I can probably get you the family of most insects. I can certainly get you the order. Order is pretty easy. Family gets a little bit more difficult. And then getting down to genus and species is even more uh, troublesome unless it's something that's really familiar to us. So even further down and much, much more specific is genus and species. And if there are 750 plus families of insects in uh, just Texas alone, there are probably millions of species of genus, of millions of species of insects. If you look at um, the genera uh, Danis, which is what our monarch butterflies are in. That also includes a number of other um, insects also, another of a number of other butterflies, not just the monarch butterfly. So even down to genus, it can include several, if not a hundred different types of insects. And then Plexippus, Danis Plexippus is our monarch butterfly. And once you get to genus and species, it's incredibly, extremely specific. So I say all this, to show you kind of why we're only gonna cover order, but also to emphasize that not every entomologist, and it doesn't make a bad entomologist if we can't tell you exactly what species of a certain insect it is that you're looking at, because many of us are studying um, a specific group and we aren't familiar with the millions of different species that are out there. So I mentioned that insects are in this phylum arthropoda. Well, what is an arthropod? Insects are arthropods, but there are other classes of arthropods because remember class insecta was just one class under that arthropod group. 
To be an arthropod, you must have an exoskeleton, and that exoskeleton has to be shed in order to grow. So that's how they complete their life cycle. They go through that series of molting, and we talked about the different types of life cycles that insects have in part one of this session. Other arthropods include crustaceans. There's class Crustacea. So these are normally aquatic um, animals. They may be marine animals, but as far as what's found on land, we have roly polies and we have pill bugs. If you eat that shrimp and you peel the exoskeleton, you peel the shell to get to the meat on the inside, you're peeling away the exoskeleton to feed on them. Class Arachnida is another class of arthropods, and these are those things that have eight legs or four pairs of legs, only two body sections. It includes ticks, mites, scorpions, all the spiders, tarantulas, which are spiders, just large hairy spiders, vinegaroons, whip scorpions, pseudo scorpions, many other things that if you're in far west Texas, you're maybe a little bit more familiar with. Then there is class Chylopoda and Diplopoda. This, these are two different classes and they include the centipedes, which are chylopoda, and diplopoda, which are the millipedes. Chylopoda, the centipedes, is the middle picture. These are venomous. They have um, big mouth parts that they can use to bite you. They have modified hind legs to trick you so you avoid that region and go to their head. And if you're a mouse, a lizard, another insect, then you get gobbled up. If you notice, they are more flattened in shape and when they run, they run kind of like an S shape. And if you look at the segments of their body, each body segment has one pair of legs versus your millipedes. If we were able to zoom in really close and see the body segments of the millipedes, then you would see and be able to count that they have two pairs of legs. So the two um, outside pictures are two different types of millipedes. Millipedes are more tunnel shaped, more dome shaped. They go kind of in a straight line and their legs do a wave as they move. They don't really snake around like uh, the centipedes do. And they are not venomous. They are organic matter feeders, fungal matter feeders. So they um, generally are harmless even in plants. Class Insecta is all of the insects, are all of the insects. And so it's a much more diverse group of classes, of, of all the classes of arthropods, and includes most of the most of the arthropods that are plant feeders, a problem in row crops, medical importance, all those things that we kind of talked about when we spoke about it in, in section one, part one. What makes an insect an insect and different from all the other classes of arthropods is that they have three separate body regions, a head, a thorax, and the hind end is an abdomen. They, on their head, of course, they have mouth parts, they have antenna. On their thorax is where their legs are attached and all insects have three pairs or six legs. They also have the ability to have up to four wings or two pairs of wings, but not every insect necessarily has two wings. The antenna on the insects makes them also unique compared to, say, spiders, but having wings, three body parts, six legs makes them unique from everybody else. So as I mentioned, there are about 30 different orders uh, to 35 different orders of insects, but we're only going to cover about 10 of those that are most commonly encountered. Dragonflies and damselflies are in the order Odonata, and this is an important order for you as a master naturalist because it is your uh, mascot. Damselflies and dragonflies have an incomplete life cycle, and they lay their eggs in the water, so their immatures are called naiads. They're always found near water, but there are some that are migratory, and so they might uh, be traveling through and there isn't necessarily a body of water that you see. They're usually very colorful. They are very territorial. So if you want to snap a picture of one or you want to collect one, if it lands in one spot, it will generally come back to the same spot. And they are considered to be very good flyers too. The difference between a damselfly and, an, and a dragonfly is the way that they hold out their wings and at rest. So a dragonfly will hold its wings straight out and a damselfly can fold it up. They can't, they don't have the ability or the muscles yet. They have yet to, they have, this species has not evolved the ability to fold the wings kind of flat over their back. 
So we believe that dragonflies are older than damselflies because damselflies have evolved muscles that at least close the wings up over the back, making them smaller in size so they're harder to catch by predators. Praying mantids um, or praying mantises are called, are in the order Mantodia. And these guys have a triangular shaped head with big eyes. Some people ask, how do you compare them? How do they look different than a walking stick? Well, to me, they look very different. The, the head is shaped very different. They have the legs that they reach out to pray with. These guys um, have an incomplete life cycle as well. And their babies are called nymphs because they are terrestrial. They lay their eggs in these egg cases called oatheca, O-O-T-H-E-C-A. And those oatheca release 30 or so little bitty teeny tiny praying mantis nymphs. These guys are sit and wait predators, which means they actually don't hunt for their food. They hunker down in a spot and they wait until that prey comes in front of them. They don't really exert any effort to go find their prey. Grasshoppers, crickets, katydids, these are all in the order Orthoptera. And I remember this because Orthoptera has a hop in it. And these are all the hoppers. If you look at them, they all have modified hind legs that have these big thunder thighs, these big muscles in their legs, and they're meant for jumping. So these guys have an incomplete life cycle. The immature is called a nymph. They have chewing mouth parts. They are plant feeders primarily, but there are some species that are predatory or even carnivorous. Uh, I'm sorry, even a uh, uh, cannibalistic. And um, even those that are meant that don't necessarily jump, jump still have those enlarged hind legs. They're winged as well, so they're able to spread and, and are fairly cosmopolitan found in um, pretty much every continent. There are some very tropical and beautiful orthopterans also. The one on the right is called a red-eyed devil, and we do find both of these in um, Texas. I can't remember what the one on the left is called, but there, some of these species can look very tropical and very pretty, and they aren't just necessarily a boring cricket or a grasshopper. The order Hemiptera is probably the second largest order. And it's if you're going to come across an insect, it's either going to be a beetle or probably a true bug or a hemipteran. Hemipteran has three different suborders to it. Hemiptera is so big and broad that I think it's important to break it down into suborder. So before I show you how you can identify heteropterans or the stink bugs and true bugs from the other guys, I think let's cover what all hemipterans have. So all hemipterans have an incomplete life cycle. Their babies are called nymphs, so they know they do not have a complete life cycle yet. Every single one of them have piercing and sucking mouth parts. So now they have adapted and modified their mouth parts to not um, to no longer chew on things. Imagine if you don't have teeth any longer, you have a long straw as your mouth part. So they're feeding on liquid food. It's either plant plant liquid or they're sucking blood out of their prey. A lot of times these guys are called stink bugs. And in the order Heteroptera, they uh, have, Heteroptera means um, partial, right? Hemi means half. So half of their wing is hard and the bottom half is membranous or soft. And they are able to fold their wings over their back. So imagine like, you know, if my sweat, if my sweater is my wings, they have, they fold their wings over their back and they form a little triangle where the wings don't overlap one another. And you can see this triangle that's formed on this harlequin bug, I think it is. The other thing that you might notice is that the bottom part portion of the wings are where the membranous or soft parts overlap. And so it has a different texture to it. So I always say, look for the triangle or look for that change in texture or color at the tip. And that will tell you if it's a stink bug or a true bug. There are aquatic hemipterans, and if you look in all these pictures, you can kind of see that triangular shape. The one on the bottom left, the triangle is, is uh, black. The one on the bottom right, here's this little triangle right here. So hemipterans are found in many different environments, aquatic being one of them. They can live under the water. They may be plant pests, and you can really see the triangles on these guys. So we've got a brown stink bug on the top left, and you can really see the change in its in the pattern of the wing. Harlequin bug on the top right, you can see its triangle right there. Green stink bug, 
Here's its triangle on the bottom right and the change where the membranous wings are overlapping. And then this is a, like a, I think it might be a red-shouldered bug. I don't think it's a milkweed bug, but it's another type of stink bug. And it has a little tiny triangle right here. And then you can see the change in the wings there. They can also be medically important or structurally important. So the one on the left is called a kissing bug. And this is um, a bug that transmits the disease chagas. Looks similar to a lot of other insects, including, and a lot of other true bugs, including um, leaf-footed bugs and maybe even squash bugs but it, is, uh, it has a lot of look-alike, so don't always assume that you've got it if you collect something. Definitely take a picture and get it identified. And then bed bugs are actually true bugs. Bed bugs are true bugs that have lost their wings, so it's hard to, you can't see the triangle on those guys, obviously. Some hemipterans are beneficial in the form of being predators and eating all the bad bugs out of your crops for you. And you can again, in that middle picture, see that triangle right there where those wings have yet to overlap, where they're folded down. So lots of different types of hemipterans. The suborder Homoptera includes the softer bodied, where we don't really see that triangle type look, types of hemipterans. And these guys are um, aphids and cicadas, leaf hoppers, tree hoppers, plant hoppers. These also have an incomplete life cycle. Generally, their body is fairly soft. There are exceptions, right? Like um, sharpshooters, leaf hoppers, and cicadas are kind of hard bodied. They have two sets of mem totally membranous wings if they have wings at all. So they don't have the half hard and half soft. And they all have piercing and sucking mouth parts. Every single one of them is a plant feeding homopteran. So here's some pictures of some very weird ones. Many times they can be sedentary. So mealybugs on the top right, scales on the, I'm sorry, on the top left, scales on the right, and aphids on the bottom left. The other type of insect that you are most likely to come across if you collect something is a beetle. If it's not a true bug, it's probably a beetle. We're now looking at insects that are more advanced and have a complete life cycle, where they have an egg, a larva, a pupa, and an adult stage. And for beetles, we call the larva a grub, usually. They have a very unique body. They, ha they have something called elytra. So their front wing is very, very hard, and it protects their soft wings underneath. So when they fly, they move those hard wings apart, the soft wings come out, and then they can take flight. Well, that's good for us in, as far as identification because when those wings are at rest, the hard wings close over and they make this perfect straight line. And if you look, you can see that perfect straight line going straight down the middle of the back. And we can see that straight line on this tiger beetle down in the bottom picture. Some of them can be metallic and very beautiful looking. The ladybug on the top right, that those wings are kind of separated a little bit. Can't see it as easily on this beetle that's a carpet beetle. And then the dung beetle, you can kind of see that straight line. So this, this, uh, these four pictures show you all different types of um, beetles that, that are found in a variety of different environments and have different um, impacts on the environment. Tiger beetles are predatory, benefic considered beneficial. Dung beetles, so we have re recycling beetles. We have other predatory beetles like a ladybug. The carpet beetle is a, usually a structural pest. Um, so many different niches that these guys can encompass because there are so many different species of beetles. And even their larva can be very diverse. We have larva like a ladybug larva at the top right that's very mobile and active and an active hunter and, and looks like its own insect almost, but it's just not an adult yet. On the right, we have top right, we have mealy, a meal bug or a mealworm, sorry, that we use to feed our tarantulas and our lizards and chickens and things like that. And they look like they don't have legs. They don't really have a head. They're kind of nondescript worm-like looking things. Bottom right, we have um, what most of us consider grubs, those C-shaped grubs. You can see the hardened head capsule, the three little legs, and then they curl up. Many different species of, of grubs. Grub is just a term that means it's a baby beetle. It doesn't mean it's killing your grass or eating anything. Then we have aquatic 
larvae that are beetles, like that middle picture on the bottom. On the left-hand picture, we even have some that have lots of hairs on their body. So a very diverse group of insects, and as a result, very diverse group of larvae. Butterflies and moths are in the order Lepidoptera. And just backtracking a minute, if beetles are in the order Coleoptera, one trick that I have to remember that beetles are in Coleoptera is that Col Coleoptera sounds like Cleopatra. Cleopatra is from Egypt, and in Egypt they worship beetles. Lepidoptera, I remember Lepidoptera because Lepidoptera is a pretty name and butterflies and moths are relatively pretty, but Lepidopterans are all butterflies, moths, and skippers. They have a complete life cycle, an egg, a larva, a pupa, and the adult. We call their larvas generally caterpillars, and we will also call their pupa cocoons or chrysalis. All Lepidopterans have scales that co cover their wings, and that's what produces the color that they have. So you're able to collect butterflies and keep them preserved, and they maintain their color forever versus other insects that will lose that color, just like we will lose the color and the rosiness in our cheeks when our blood stops pumping. But they maintain their color as long as they maintain their scales, because, and the scales don't fade from the sun, because the colors in the scales not in their body pigment. The adults have straw-like mouth parts that are called a proboscis, so they will unroll their mouth parts and suck up nectar and juices. Their larvae, the caterpillars, have chewing mouth parts, which is very unique that they have two totally different types of mouth parts. And they aren't necessarily so good because they're eating plant material. There's a very diverse group of these caterpillars. Um, some of them are really hairy. This is a bad guy. This is called a pus caterpillar on the top left. On the top right, that's an inchworm. Some of them can have an inchworm or a looper look. Another fuzzy one down on the bottom right. And then some can be very pretty and unique. My rule of thumb is if you catch a caterpillar, you're not sure if it's good or bad, it's eating up your plants. If it's a boring, it's gray, it's brown, it's really not that pretty, it's going to become a boring moth. If it's very attractive in color, has even ha having hairs and spines on its body, these will these three, because they're attractive, memorable, generally will turn into something that we would consider to be attractive. So if you're worried about killing a pretty butterfly and he's a boring, ugly caterpillar, you're probably not going to. Their pupa are also pretty unique and different as well. You know, the monarch caterpillar being kind of shiny and looks like it's wet is very... Um, memorable to us. Some of them look like they've just taken, you know, grass and debris and wrapped it around themselves. And then this is kind of a, a swallowtail caterpillar. Probably many of, I mean, sorry, uh, pupa. Probably many of you have seen that cocoon before. Flies, mosquitoes, and gnats are in the order diptera. Di means two. And terra, if you've seen it throughout all these orders, means winged form. So these are two winged insects. So they only have one pair of wings, which is their front wings, and their hind wings are modified into something called haltiers. These haltiers you can see in this top right-hand picture on the crane fly, very exaggerated large haltiers. And those help them supposedly maintain balance like rudders on a plane. They have a complete life cycle, and we generally call their larvae maggots. And they have a variety of different types of mouth parts. We know mosquitoes have sucking mouth parts. Houseflies have a sponging mouth part, so they only have a sponging mouth. They sop up liquid, um, gooey kind of food. And then some have biting mouth parts also, like horseflies. Ants, bees, wasps are in the order Hymenoptera. And all of these are insects that have a pinched waist. So we can really identify and decipher the difference between the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. The only exception maybe is honeybees. They have a little bit more thicker waist to their body. And these guys have a complete life cycle. This is a species of, or this is an order of insects that has the ability to have a stinger. The stinger is usually a modified ovipositor, which an ovipositor is an egg layer, an egg depositor. So it, these are usually in social insects where like fire ants or honeybees or um, yellow jackets, where the workers cannot lay eggs, but they, or they cannot mate at least, but they do have the ability to sting instead. The queen can't sting, but she lays eggs instead. 
And these a lot of times have a, a caste system associated with them. Some of them are truly social, some are quasi-social, so they have different levels of sociality from truly or eusocial down to not social at all or solitary. My absolute favorite order of insects is called Neuroptera, and these are the lacewings, the antlions, the dobson flies, the owl flies, other odd ones like snake flies and mantispids. These all have chewing mouth parts and a complete life cycle, and many of them are associated with aquatic environments. They're called Neuroptera uh, because they have a lot of veins that run through their wings, a lot of, looks like nerves, right? So many, many veins, very lacy, and their, their wings are generally held over the body like a tent would be. There's lots of different types of neuropterans. In this first picture here, these are the, the Dobson flies. Used to be Dobson flies were in their own order, Megaloptera, but nowadays they're connected with Neuroptera. And um, Dobson flies are aquatic, very, very large insects. Their mouth parts um, on females, which is the bottom picture, can chew and chomp you. The male has modified mandibles meant to just hold on to the female during mating. Other neuropterans include, the top pictures are a green lacewing and a brown lacewing, both beneficial insects. All neuropterans actually are considered beneficial. The bottom picture is a species of an ant lion, adult, and the right hand picture is that ant lion nymph that makes those caverns in the ground and if you dangle food in front of it, they'll come out with those big old chompers trying to grab their prey. Some really interesting, or one of my favorite neuropterans is a mantispid or a mantis fly. And this looks really similar to a praying mantis, but it isn't. It has the lacy wings. It's much smaller. Coloration is different, at least in that right-hand picture. Almost looks like a wasp praying mantis. And, it, and their, um, their praying legs, those raptorial legs, are different if you compared them with a praying mantis, both in their shape and the way they reach out, but also in the location on the body, higher up to the head versus a praying mantis being closer to the second set of legs. Well, I hope that gave you a good overview of what makes an insect an insect, a little into 101, the morphology of insects, and then how to identify some of those more common insect orders. If you're interested in learning more about entomology um, and identifying some species, then I would highly recommend that you check out our My Extension 210 website, YouTube channel, because we have a lot of posted, archived webinars up there that might cover a topic that you are interested in learning a little bit more about. We also have um, webinars that we're still trying to host, and you can check out those on our website, bear-tx.tamu.edu. There's my email address and our office phone number, so if you ever have questions about identifying an insect, controlling an insect, or insect questions in general, feel free to reach out and contact me. I will tell you that I'm always out doing presentations, so email is usually the best way to get an answer from me very quickly because I tend to check my email many, many times a day versus being in the office rarely to check voicemail.